uh, all these things are going to happen, and I hang up the phone. My dad says, now what? I says, just wait. I says, yeah, it'll probably take maybe 10, 15 minutes. I says, the phone's going to ring. Sure enough, eight minutes goes by and the phone rings. Can you be in my office in five minutes? So we go in there, go over to the lawyer's office, about six blocks from my mom and dad's house. By the way, they lived in Tampa, Florida at the time. And we walk in there and shake hands with the man. Nice, warm handshake. And then uh, I introduce myself as plenipotentiary judge, David Windmiller, and that I have your signed confession here for all these criminal acts. I had a whole list of them. I think it was about 22 of them that I read off to him. And how he had acted to create this language and work with the insurance company who created the language to violate the Securities and Exchange Commission's rules and regulations and constitute mail fraud. Then we got up and said, uh, we want $385,000. And I went to shake his hand, and he couldn't move his fingers. There was no blood left in his arm. His hand was as cold as if he had just soaked it in ice water for the last 10 minutes, and he couldn't move his fingers to shake hands goodbye. He couldn't talk. He couldn't hold a pen in his hand either to, say, to even take notes. He was that scared. And again, the next morning, we got a check for $2,500. My dad says, what do I do? I said, tear it up. Tomorrow there'll be a check for $3,500. Wednesday there'll be a check for $4,500. Thursday there'll be a check for $5,500, and so on, until we hit $38,500. And so every day, for the next 30 days, there was $1,000 more a day. And when he hit $38,500, he said, Dad, take the check down to the bank and cash it. You're all done. You got paid. They're going to take care of your car, your hospital bills, and you got $38,500 in your pocket, and it's tax-free because it's personal injury. And that was it. We never heard from the insurance company again. If you know how to get through the gauntlet, any one of you got a personal injury case, and I got the technology to take this as forensic evidence to get paid in 30 days. And I can guarantee that. I don't care where you stand in the country. Because we told, uh, I'm going <clears> to, <throat> we're going to contact the insurance company. I sent text AIG. It was $100 a share. It dropped to a buck 50. I sent text this insurance company's paperwork, and they're, they're going to be out of business. And they already know what I did to AIG. So the minute I file a claim with these guys and tell them that I'm on board watching, they'll probably get this settled in the next 30 days without ever setting foot in a courtroom. And they'll get exactly what they want. When, I, when you get proficient at this information, and I talk to you on the phone, I'll say uh, 26, 56, 72. You know that if you go to page 26 in my book, you're going to get the definitions, the tricks and the traps. You go to 52, you're going to get an 18-page title 42. And if you go to 72, you're going to know how to prosecute an attorney in cross-examination. Now, if I only got two or three seconds to give you information, or you're in court and you're at the witness stand and I'm not allowed to talk to you and the judge has ordered me to sit there and keep my mouth shut, I can use, I can do this and do this. I just said 23. I says use page 23 for the tricks and the traps. You've already got it memorized and you can go ahead and download on the judge because you just, was something you got nervous and forgot about. That's how do you think basketball and baseball players talk in football. They're sitting there doing this here. You know, they're giving sign language to each other on the field, soccer, hockey, doesn't matter what it is, they, they all talk in sign language because these are preempted uh, documents. And all you have to do is be told what number to use, and it downloads 10,000 words of information. That's the unique thing about this technology. You can help each other once you, once you read the book, and you, got, you know where the page is. Pay attention to the pages because if you work out a code with somebody else and you need a partner in court, he can talk to you through sign language. You know, he just sit there and do this, do this. <laughs> you know, because when a judge talks to the DA in court, you won't even see this happening. Yeah, and uh, Stephen showed you this a little bit of this yesterday. When we're cross examining, the judge is doing this here, meaning talking to the DA, saying, You open your mouth, you're going to go to, you ain't never going to have another case in here. Or the DA is asking for prison time in a case, and the judge is sitting there doing this here, which means I want four years in prison. The DA is, is sitting there going, no, I want, I want five years in prison, or 10 years in prison. And the judge says, no, I'm only going to give him three. 
And the other guy, the other prosecuting attorney, he's there and he's going, well, how about just two, you know? So they're having a conversation like this, using their fingers on their face. And they got this all rehearsed in the back room as they're going to negotiate in court. And they'll be talking one thing, but they're actually using fingers to, to articulate how many months or how many years this person is going to go to jail. So pay attention to the sign languages that are taking place in court, because if you know how it's being done, and I was in the gallery, and these guys were all doing the sign language, and I says, excuse me, uh, court reporter, these guys are talking in sign language, and you're not getting the whole story here. And she got up and walked out of the courtroom. The case was called because they didn't have a court reporter. And they got caught. Mm. Okay. <laughs> with that sentence, there, there, there still are some serious uh, issues I have with it. Um, that's not in the first tense, uh, not in the first person. It's it's on the th it starts off with the third person, and it doesn't specify that you were the runner. That I witnessed you running. Um, yeah, your witnessing claim is here. Right, but it doesn't specify who the runner okay, is. Okay, then we just add you as Sam's witnessing Sam's claim. witnessing claim. Right. How about that? Can we that? change the, the, the first uh, Sam to um, my, for, for my knowledge or for, the my, um, for my personal knowledge? Yeah, because the, you're not, re see, you're the person that's watching a runner. It's ir the runner is irrelevant. He doesn't require the knowledge. He's in part of the sentence. It's your knowledge. You're the witness. So can I use the word uh, uh, personal pronoun instead of the name? Use what? My, the personal pronoun, my. No. My or mine. No, we don't use my, we don't use your, we don't use yourself, we don't use I or me. We don't use any of those because they're not first person specific. You have to have a specific name when you talk in a lawsuit. You have to specifically say that you are the claimant. Now, this is another thing I didn't tell you. When you write a lawsuit, at the beginning, the first thing says, David Wynn Miller, claimant. My name will be used as the claimant throughout the next 150 doc sentences on the page. At no other time will my name be used as a first person specific, because claimant is first person specific. <coughs> now, when I'm in uh, a case I, with three other people as a witness, so we have three claimants. Now, the, uh, in every, every sentence that ends where it's witnessing or making a claim against the other parties doing the damage, it says for the, by the claimants, because we are acting as a corporation suing this one individual, and we, the three of us witnessing, two or more, it's going to be claimants. And that way I don't have to keep writing everybody's name. It makes it, it simplifies the way documents are written when in law. This is standard procedure whether it be fiction or in my technology, in fact, that, that terminology and that way of writing is standardized worldwide. So the personal names are interchangeable with claimant in whatever uh, capacity it's on the documents, but never with a personal pronoun. Right. You can't use a pronoun because you immediately drop it. You didn't take jurisdiction for the pronoun. Right. Um, then on the end of the sentence, if you can't use a personal pronoun, um, what can you use to identify the, um, the person who was running? Can, well, if you have his you name, you're just pain? simply witnessing a runner, that's all. Right, no, I'm making a witness that I can identify the runner, not just witnessing a runner. You want to identify your son as being the runner? Then put right. his personal name in here. And you can go here for Sam's knowledge of, of the, and then put a, pers a specific name and drop all this, take out one runner and just put a specific name is with a witnessing claim of the one runner. Who's the one runner? Well, instead of one runner, it would be the, your son's name as the runner. Right. But my, my, let, my letter or uh, claim is against you. So would I put your name in? I mean, it's not I'm necessarily the runner? against, but making a statement. Of, yes, if you witness. want to state, because when you're going to swear, a, swear out an affidavit that you witness somebody, you can't use generics. You have to be specific that I saw this person shoot this person and use his full name at this time and place and location. And now everything is time sensitive in law. Everything is location sensitive because of jurisdiction in law. 
or in the law? Location sensitive. Location, right? Jurisdiction comes under. So a sentence, a sentence is not only uh, it's it's some some location you have to you have to account for the time that the incident took place. You have to t account for the location because of jurisdiction. You have to account for the specific individuals who are and give as much specific information, the name, address, social security number, this has to appear someplace in the document. Uh, and any, uh, any witnesses that will corroborate your position in another sentence, because a document is a bonded document. So all these, all these points of information go together as a complete thought. If I were to write a document in the first person referring to myself as I, I did this, I saw that, I did the other thing. No, you would be I a claimant. To, and then I gave it to the judge. And the judge would read it. Out loud, and the judge would be the one being the eye. He'd be saying, I, I, and the judge would be saying, I didn't do that. I right. Away, which is the reason why we need to be specific. That's so, why you're a claimant. You see, gold miners didn't file mortgages. They didn't file promises. They filed claims because claim and gold go together. That's why we use the word claimant. It's the strongest position of who you are. You're not a defendant. That's no contract. You're not a petitioner because you're not there yet. A petitioner is asking permission in the future, but is not a claimant because he has knowledge firsthand. You're not a respondent, which means no spoken contract. Now you're mute before the court. You don't want to be a respondent or a defendant. You are a, either Vasily, which is a servant employee of this document because your name's on it. You are better known as the United States. Two or more people coming together on a contract is the United States. The United States is defined as two or more people. You can either be the claimant or a Vasile. V-A-S-S-A-L-E-E. -E. The word Vasile, I copyrighted in 1999. That word never existed. Look up E-E -E in any dictionary that says employee. It's a fact. It's a word. E-E -E is a fact. You can use it in a Scrabble game. And that Vasile is a servant. A vessel is a... Vessel is V-E-S-S-A-E-L, and Vassal is V-A-S-S-A-L. And Vassal is a servant employee of the paper. So if your name's on here, it's been stamped, you're under postal contract for commerce, they can't get out of it. Yes? Thank you, David. You mentioned page 23. Is this I, the book? Yes. 23 is not in here. Am I missing something? Or? Oh, it isn't? Well, it's just misnumbered, that's all. <laughs> I write the numbers in by hand. Okay. It goes from 22 to 24. Did you lose one? Oh, I get it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> when, I, when I did those, because we made changes in them constantly, where I would take something out of content, and say, well, this document isn't big enough, and I'll add two pages. I'll have 23A, 23B, because I didn't have time to rewrite all the numbers on all the pages from the master, from the master book that I have. Otherwise, it's, a, it's an issue. The master program, in other words, in my computer, was destroyed when my computer was burned up in the fire. And so the, the documents that I have that were completed have not been re hand retyped all back into the computer. So when we were going to change only one page between printings of one book and another book, I didn't have time to go out and hand type the entire 107 pages. That's nine point print. That's about three months of work for me. I'm not a speed typer. I'm still one finger here. <laughs> yeah. All time. Do you want to take your 10, 30, 11 o'clock break? I noticed your book was all in uppercase shout. Any shout, right. A that? shout is a command. You must, you must be obeyed. You see, the government said, uh, this all came about in the Moser case with the uh, Secretary of State of the state of Wisconsin, or no, excuse me, the Attorney General of Wisconsin. Sued, I sued the Attorney General of Wisconsin for fraud in a lawsuit back in 1996. And this was in front of Judge Moser, the 96-year-old judge. And he went ahead and said, uh, Mr. Miller, why did you write all of your 12-page your document in uppercase? 
And he says, I noticed the E is a little higher too. I says, well, I had a 1952 Bell typewriter. He says, you know, he says, that's the same one I used when I went to law school. He says, that damn E always, they had a <laughs> kicked up. He says, that was the old ribbon, you know, the old ribbon typewriters to see in the black and white movies. Well, that's what I wrote my very first lawsuit on. And uh, he kind of chuckled with that. And he says, how come you didn't, how come you didn't write it in lowercase? I says, well, the uh, lowercase key is busted on there. He says, well, how come your name's in upper and lowercase? I says, because I had to use a needle nose pliers to pull a key up and then tap it with a screwdriver <laughs> to write my name in upper and lower case to make it work and to do a whole document like that would be kind of redundant. This is when I was real poor and starting out, you know. So he, had, he, had, he says, well, I got to give you credit. He says, how long did it take you to type this? I says, four months. He says, just with a, one key at a time and making sure that the typewriter was working right and replacing ribbons. He says, it was quite a mess. He says, yeah, I see all the smudges on here. So then he turns to McDermott. Now McDermott was the attorney general at the time of Wisconsin. He says, how come you did, how come you wrote all your lawsuits back to Mr. Miller and all for case? He says, well, I didn't know what he was doing, so I copied him. <laughs> he says, you're the attorney general. You're supposed to know syntax. The attorney general says, what syntax? <laughs> well, after the judge got on laughing, he says, all right, he says, uh, it means shout. And that's when he educated me on the word shout and do what I was doing. He says, it's a command that must be obeyed. He says, because you wrote in syntax, a syntax command has jurisdiction over an adverb verb, which doesn't say anything in shout. It's just shouting nothing. Now, I won that case because I wrote it in, in, in shout and I wrote it in, in correct syntax. And that's why my book has always been an uppercase shout and so is my website. Now, even when I type on the computer, I send, messages back and forth on my emails, I, I put it in uppercase and a lot of my students come back and what are you shouting at me for? Some people know about it, but it's, it's a word that most people don't know about. That's it. Uh, you guys satisfied with this and I'll put another sentence up. Take your break and uh, while you're taking your break, I'll do the writing. Yeah. David, can you please talk about, um, you mentioned about your um, near death or death experience. No, I wasn't near death. I was legally dead by all medical reasons for 35 minutes. Can you, can you talk about that? And can you sort of talk about around your purpose, around what you're here to sort of the big picture around what you're to, to communicate and what the end game is? And also, um, some people make comments about walk-in energies and conjuring and, and channeling information, data, where that's coming from for you. Well, okay. How many of you remember the old TV series? I don't know if they brought that broadcast this down here. Walk, uh, I Dream a Genie by Barbara Eden. Some of you saw that, okay. Well, I was 18 years old one day and I, I was watching that on TV and Genie's father came in, he was the big zen and took away Genie's powers and gave them back to her at the end of the show. And after the show was over, I said to myself, uh, of course the fantasy of Genie's and having all the power in the world, what is power? The word power is meek, M-E-E-K. The Bibles, the Bibles all around the world tell you the meek shall inherit the earth. A meek person has absolute power over life and death. And he uses it to teach people. He's a teacher. He does not use his power to hurt anybody. That's what the word doctor means, isn't it? Teacher. Doctor? The word doctor, I think it means teacher. I don't know. I haven't looked that one up or researched it. Uh, so I, I looked up the word meek. I, I found out what the definition of it was. And then I was 18 years old and I stood in front of the mirror and I looked at myself in the mirror and I says, if you were given absolute power, the knowledge over all things, what would you do with it? And I says, well, I wouldn't hurt anybody with it because I'm not, I don't, it's not part of my personality. And I like to teach people. So I says, I'd become a teacher. And I said to myself out loud, would you make a promise to yourself that if you were given absolute power that you would become responsible as a teacher? And we'd never hurt anybody with it. And I says, yeah, I would do that. So I'm having a, a two-way conversation with me and the guy in the mirror. Don't laugh. I was a marriage counselor for 12 years. I, I know how to talk, how to communicate with people and how do people communicate with other people. So I'm, I'm gonna share this with you. So I said, yeah, I can do that. I made a promise to myself that I was ever given the 
the absolute power that I would become the teacher. And I would be a friend and expand upon that and dedicate my life to it. Well, a few years later, a couple days after that, I got beat up in the 1968 riots in Milwaukee. And I was held down by four boys while the fifth one proceeded to kick my right kidney like you tee a football. And it killed my right kidney and they damaged my left one. So I got kicked four times in the left side and seven times in the right side. So my I had a dead kidney in me for seven years. It was excruciating pain on a day-to-day -day basis because I had a sack as big as my fist of dead black material in my side. And even at that, I had to work every day doing physical labor with the pain, and I got used to it. So my body created a super immune system because of the level of poison I had to deal with. Then when I was on December 3rd, 1975, I went into surgery to do an exploratory. The doctor, Pollard, who was the number one kidney specialist, he, I don't think he's alive today, uh, was supposed to do the surgery. He was out on the golf course. All the doctors came into the operating room with masks on. And I had a South Korean doctor who was only there as an apprentice who had never cut anybody in their life, started to slice into me. Took out three ribs, took out my dead kidney, took my adrenal gland off the right side as well, then he thought he was supposed to take both kidneys out. So because he couldn't, didn't want to cut the other side open because I was already laid in half from my navel to my spine, he went ahead and he went through my chest cavity, pulling everything apart, and uh, cut my left, he couldn't get at the left kidney completely, so he cut the left kidney in half and he removed the left kidney, top half. There's five chambers, he took the two out with the adrenal gland. As soon as he removed my adrenal gland, I went into anesthesia shock and I was flatlined because anesthesia is a poison. I was legally dead, and he knew they screwed up. And of course, they told my parents and my brothers and sisters that I had died. And I was in the morgue for 35 minutes, cut in half, laying on a gurney. And the, the head nurse was down there, and she, she's the one that told me the story after the fact. She says, uh, your heart started beating. And the, the coroner just said, oh, just let it, it's just gas from the body decomposing. And he, she went and she pulled my eye open with a flashlight and she says, no, his eyes responding. His brain's alive. We've got to sew him back up. So they called the code blue, rushed me back upstairs, took him 11 and a half hours to put me back together. After, they couldn't figure out why I was alive without adrenaline. And when they did the blood work, my endorphin level was 60 times higher than a normal person, which is an amino acid <clears throat> with no adrenaline in my system. I had been completely altered for some reason. Now the adrenaline that I have, now the, the endorphin that I have is an amino acid which is the food for the brain. After I found out over the years of researching why I was still alive, and the, uh, the hospital continued to maintain my blood type every month, take blood samples to see why I was still walking around because you can't live without adrenaline. And having half of one kidney, I didn't require any dialysis either. And I was in perfect health. And I also had a 25 heartbeat. Anything below 40, you'd be in a coma. And I'm walking around with 25. And I did this for 35 years with 25, until I electrocuted myself in my garage and it went up to 60. <laughs> <laughs> Kid you not, I forgot to unplug the extension cord when I put the, put the end of it together. And I grabbed it with one hand, the socket and the screwdriver in the other, and I <laughs> Took 110 across the chest and reprogrammed my heart from 25 beats a minute to 60 beats a minute. Now it's back to like 30 beats a minute right now, 30, 35. About at three years I had a lot of energy. <laughs> but the, uh, the endorphin levels, uh, and I, with me staying awake and maintaining A average in school, working two full-time jobs at the same time, not sleeping, my nephew comes to me. He's, he's having trouble staying awake. He's going to computer school and he says, Uncle David, he says, how do you do it? How do you run 24 hours a day without sleep, go to college and do all these things that you do, studying, working? He says, what's your secret? And I says, well, it's the endorphins. I says, the endorphins that I have are brain food. Now what they've done is they have accelerated my IQ from 140 to over 200 because it made neurons Remember the movie Phenomena with John Travolta, where he had a brain, 
uh, cancer, which was fibristic and connected uh, brain cells. Well, that's what happens with you increase your amino acid in the brain. You take a 400% dosage of the amino acid, which is the brain food, and it causes your neurons, instead of having six contacts per nerves, I got like 20. So the exponential contacts of all the nerves have given me a brain that's like a supercomputer. And then it grew both of my brains together. So I only have one brain. I don't have two hemispheres, I have one. They did this in a CAT scan to prove this because of all the connections. So I re I'll do this for you as soon as we get the board off of here. Uh, I write with both hands frontwards, backwards, and in both directions at the same time, legibly. I can write left-handed as easy as I write right-handed. Frontwards, though, I don't have to do this like Obama does. So I can, my, my left side can see my right side, and my right side can see my left side. And why I read left to right in subject matter, I read backwards at 400 words a second in math codes. It's kind of something that only I do. I can't teach it to anybody. It's just something I do. And it allows me to absorb huge amounts of information. Uh, people bring me lawsuits. I did one last night for an hour. I had a hundred, I think it was about 100 pages, 120 pages to read in an hour. And then come up with all the solutions of how to solve the problem with all the laws, rules, and regulations. And to me, it's just a cakewalk to, to, to absorb that much information and process it. Same thing it is to break, break down sentences and, and show you what the, the secret codes mean. And what we're going to do here, uh, well, I'm not done with this. The amino acid, everyone in here has amino acids that feed your brain. Now you have, uh, I believe it's 14... 14 or 18 different blood types and groups, and there's eight amino acids in your body. So your chances are one in 64 that you're gonna hit the right one. If you can isolate the amino acid based on your blood type to feed your brain, you can go to a, uh, one of these nutrient stores like GNC. That's what we have up in the United States called GNC. It's a nutrient store. And you can isolate your blood, your amino acid for your brain and take a 400% dosage every day, you can increase your IQ every day. Now, when I was in, in Denver, I had a man who was involved in an automobile accident and he had part of his brain removed and he was mentally retarded when he came to the seminar, he could barely speak. And he found his amino acid and he went on a 400% a day dose and he also used a frequency zapper to accelerate uh, cell regeneration. And he came back to a seminar 12 weeks later. He had a full-time job, and his IQ went up 60 points. He went from mentally retarded to being a normal person, carrying on a normal conversation with anybody and having a full-time job, and he got his life back. And he stood up and did a testimony for all the people in the audience as to where he, the people met him the week be, when I was there the first time and they came back three months later and it, the same people came to the seminar. And now they got to see this man who had recovered from, a, from being mentally retarded to being a normal person again because he was taking the amino acids to rebuild his brain. So anybody can do it. You just gotta figure out what it is. Now you would have to go to a doctor, have your blood analyzed, Isolate the amino acids that are in your blood and then find the one that's specifically generated for your brain and you got to get a doctor to cooperate with you. And usually anesthesiologists are the ones that specialize in the blood chemistry because they have to use anesthesia with the blood and they got to cook this formula up together. So they would be the people to go to. Your country might not allow this. And you know what the most dangerous person in the world is? An educated person. Look at what I'm doing with education and the, the way I flip planet Earth over, having syntax. So I was given the, the gift of, if you ask a judge what does syntax mean, he says it is the most powerful thing on planet Earth. He who controls syntax controls the world. Because this technology disqualifies everything that's ever been written. And the most expensive, high page, uh, rather the highest paying job around is brain surgery, followed by contract writers. 
If you can write contracts and syntax, like I'm writing constitutions, I can sit down and, and it took me three months to write the United Nations Constitution, Australia's, New Zealand, and Hawaii's constitutions. And what I do is I take the existing constitutions, I remove all the things that are future, all the things that are past, all the things that are negative. Get a book of synonyms, look up every single word, find the now time definition, organize the words in the correct sentence structure, communication syntax, and then put the missing words in to complete the sentence. And it's all done algebraically. Once the algebra is certified frontwards and backwards, and the sentence can't be obstructed, it's then put into the Constitution, and there's 69 sentences in the Constitution. It is a foundation by which you can study from to improve. And I think as a group of 50, you were to read the Constitution as a group and try to add more things to it, you could make it better. But in New Zealand, as well as the Origines here in Australia, the question was, well, somebody's got to do something. Somebody's got to do something. The American Indians, somebody's got to do something. That's all I hear is somebody's got to do something. The, the Canadian Indians, the Eskimos, every place I go in the world, somebody's got to do something. I'm going, well, okay. I'm going to do it. And I went ahead and I wrote all these constitutions. I wrote these lawsuits. I wrote all these programs. I put everything together. I said, I don't need your permission to do it. You prove it's wrong or make it better than it is. And there's your motivation. What is meek? Meek means I have the power to control the thinking capacity of six million people. To take this planet screaming and hollering into the future. I want a world where my kids can grow up. That they don't have to play what is the answer to two? <laughs> or what is your name? Where word games can't be an issue. That everything is as black and white as a math problem because nobody ever went to war over a math problem. So I broke the code and I wrote the language in a math problem that no one can argue with. It removes anger. Some of you people have, have been like, I don't know, how many seminars have you been to now, Steve? 12? Besides the ones you do? And even the, one that, even the ones that he does, when I'm not there, there's a philosophy of this teaching program because it's a math procedure. Your brain is looking at things mathematically. It's not looking at it from an emotional standpoint. Even me talking about religion yesterday. Who is God? I didn't see anybody in here get upset because I watched your faces and you all smiled. You said, that was how I learned religion from a thousand different sources. And it was so unique to me that nobody else can tell me who my God is. And it's the same thing with this technology. Whether he teaches it or I teaches it, the audience are at peace with it because it's a math procedure. It doesn't irritate the brain of, this man lied to me or told me something that wasn't true. And, I, and after 940 seminars in front of tens of thousands of people, and nobody gets upset, uh, we must be doing something right. And we don't get any negative feedback. And I want to make another statement about the scam site on the internet. All the people that are involved in a scam site were, were criminals, committed criminal acts, and went to jail for criminal acts. They tried to use truth to get out of criminal acts. Didn't work. So they went ahead and they put their thing up there saying, truth doesn't work to save me from me doing something bad. And this, this girl called uh, Colleen Darling Lloyd, who claims to be my wife, she worked at an employment agency. She downloaded my credit report, got my social security number, and then had four MasterCards issued as my wife because she had all the classified information under identity theft. She did it to 12 other men as well. She then went on a shopping spree for 100,000 bucks. She took 4,000 off of my card alone. Yeah, and I prosecuted her and put her in prison, in Utah State Prison for five years. And she worked for an attorney when all this was going on. He bought the, New York, the Las Vegas Times newspaper to slander me. And she used to be an employee at that at, at newspaper and she followed this program because she got arrested several times and put in jail for wrongdoing. And I had her cases dismissed because I was doing seminars in Las Vegas, roughly 14 different seminars, and she came to follow the program. And because uh, 
she felt she, had, uh, she was writing all these good articles. She was in, uh, had a, what's the word I want on here? She looked at me as being her savior because I could always make her lawsuits go away. And she wrote good articles in the newspaper because all the lawsuits I won in court in Las Vegas as well. And then when a lot lawyers were being embarrassed and judges were being embarrassed, the Lawyers Association bought the newspaper and then slandered the truthful 